Mike Bledsoe here, CEO of the Shrug Collective. If you haven't already noticed, we've got a lot of new cool stuff going on. If you hit shrugcollective.com, you'll see some great content that you won't be catching if you're only listening to the podcast. Hit the website and see the new look and feel. This week, we get to introduce you to two new shows. Today, we bring you Body of Knowledge. This show has been created by a couple of guys you already know, Dr. Andy Galpin and Kenny Kane. They've had their own project, and I love that we get to share it with you here. As we're expanding and improving the shows, we have partnered with amazing companies that we believe in. We talk and hang out with the people who run these businesses and know why they do what they do. Not all products are created equal, even if it looks like it on the surface. We've done the research and have been in the industry long enough to see what really works and what will make the biggest difference for you long term. With that being said, one of my favorite companies, Thrive Market has a special offer for you. You get $60 of free organic groceries, plus free shipping, and a 30-day trial. Go to thrivemarket.com body. This is how it works. Users will get $20 off their first three orders of $49 or more, plus free shipping. No code is necessary because the discount will be applied at checkout. Many of you will be going to the store this week anyway, so hit up Thrive Market today. Thrivemarket.com body. Enjoy the show. Hey, hey, fellow bipeds. It is me, Kenny Kane, one of the co-hosts of The Body of Knowledge. Now, today's guests, Michael Blevins and myself, are going to be heading to London on Saturday, May 13th at 12 p.m. Now, we're going to be talking for about three hours about some pretty big picture coaching themes. Context, transformation, and the evolution of human performance. Seating is limited because I can only hold four people on my thighs. So for more information, go to thebodyofknowledge.com or Perpetua Fitness. Thanks, guys. We hope to see you out there and enjoy today's show. Um, can we start again? Yeah. Where's the future of this understanding going? Don't know. Why? Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> We are not a singular thing. We are built to change. At the most advanced levels of everything, it comes down to fundamental basics. These are general health practices that every human should be striving for. It's candy madness. Scream if you like candy. I don't know where that came from. I wasn't listening. I was just thinking about that. <laughs> he's great. he's gold. Yeah, he's good. So good. The guy so just funny. spits gold, man. Yeah. So you're living up to Jack Osborne. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Well, you got your own thing, dude. I mean, if I was gonna, I'm more like the person, you know, dodging clubs like a seal, but maybe uh. a walrus. <laughs> <laughs> People appreciate me, but not enough to save me. <laughs> <laughs> enough to be like, oh, man, that's too bad, but not enough to actually do anything. <laughs> yeah, cl- yeah, yeah, because walruses aren't cute. Right. Right. Yeah. It's the whole good-looking thing. You got to... You gotta have that up on you. So yeah. Jack is lucky. Jack gets to be a, a cute animal. <laughs> Good people, if you're just turn, tuning in, uh, this is the voice of Michael Blevins. He is Henry Cavill's trainer. Uh, the Henry played Superman most recently in the Superman movies. So welcome, Michael Blevins, to the Body of Knowledge. Alongside me is, as always, Andy Galpin. Uh, Michael, you've had a very interesting. Uh, s- story to becoming Superman's trainer. As it were, at one point you were a hairdresser turned semi-professional road cyclist, s- turned many other things along the way. Your path is, I would say, uh, very unique, and I'm very excited about having you uh, on today to kind of talk about your road to getting to where you're at. So, um, first of all, what is going on in all these uh, superhero stories and where are you going to be in the uh, coming months and years? Well, I mean, in the movies themselves, it seems like all of them end in some kind of apocalypse hell. And I have no idea how we rebuild that many cities before the next one, but I, I don't understand the logistics of it. Not your job though. Not my <laughs> job. I let them destroy things and I, I tend to build things. Um, It's really interesting because there's definitely a precedent set for what a superhero looks like. And it's not 
what we see even in fitness magazines, it's what people drew in the 50s and mm. in the 60s. Like they, it's go, it goes beyond what we know like humans were capable and we had to live up to that expectation. And I think that <laughs> that in itself had made it made the problem solving of uh, making a superhero uh, match what our ideals are and hit the standards really, really, uh, the standards really, really high. And uh, that process is, uh, it's interesting, um, but the the components to it, I think, are really misguided in, in what most people think. What we recognized in doing this thing is that uh, most of the components that go into, into making a, a superhero or the person can do it, we have to actually start, start with a foundation of like a mentality to be able to accomplish these tasks. Uh, you can lift all the weights in the world, you can do all the diets in the world that you want, but there's this underlining foundation of mindset and, and the ability to accomplish a task and like what I think I'm capable. I have to move past that because most people live in that world. And so that's what's led to what people see on the screen as like, oh, look at the six pack. And look, right. oh, he's got the abs and the, the, the shoulders are big. And it's like, yeah, 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 that stuff's there. But it was because of this transformation process. So it's bigger than just being disciplined. 100%. And, and obviously discipline um, – that's a huge component of it because that's the maybe that's the day-to-day -day habits that get you to think the discipline to not eat the donut the discipline to eat the donut when you need to i have to throw that in there because a lot of people bash on donuts and i just gotta i gotta come swinging <laughs> <laughs> donut lover uh no but defender of justice <laughs> 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 okay <laughs> for for the listeners how how long does it take to prepare an actor for a role like superman uh it, it definitely depends on the individual the first input is is where that person comes from like what their background is how they've taken care of themselves because we do we do damage control first once we do uh damage control then we're generally looking at you know a six month period a good, you know, we've been done faster. You have the ability to go faster, but six month is a good buffer into taking somebody from point A to point B, which looks unrealistic to normal people. I guess I didn't really even think about this before, but he doesn't have to look good for that day. How long does a movie t shoot take? Because he's got to look good the whole time, right? Right. right. And they're going to cut scenes in different orders, so he can't look completely different from one month to three months down the road, right? 100%. And that's what a lot I didn't of... think about that. That's where it becomes kind of a specialty. And ju I, I would give a lot of credit to bodybuilding is in the form of uh, it gave us a lot of information on totally. how to do the original task. But the day thing is a real trick because the deprivation involved in that is like, well, I know it's just this one lasting thing. And if you hit your mark right, the next day you can eat whatever you want. So a movie generally, uh, pre-production in my experience has been about three months. And it'll go anywhere from three months of filming to six months of filming. And I've been on them as long as a year. And the year thing's really rough. But that's why I set very realistic goals that can be maintained, not just seen once. Yeah. And so uh, in in most films, there's generally, so it's not all, they don't have to look identical all the time, but they've got to be real close. And so we usually look at the shirtless scenes that are because they're, uh, we want to show what they built. So like if you're a Jason Statham, it's like whenever you're about to fight somebody. Right. You're like, <laughs> right. fuck this shirt. <laughs> just like, <laughs> too restrictive, too restrictive. Yeah. God, why did I wear this T-shirt? I can't kick in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there's the glorification of it. And to be honest, I think it's fair. Yeah. Well, what's funny, Michael, is that you know you and I go back, and we have had adjacent paths for many mm -hmm. years. And and funnily enough, it it took us probably ten years to circle towards mm -hmm. each other. Um, but one of the things that you talk about is your general frustration with the lack of understanding that's something you just identified, and that is the mindset. Like people want to go to you to basically say, okay, what is it to equal the, the abs and the shoulders and the pecs or whatever? But you started with something very critical to me in this conversation in the mindset. What are the key pieces that you have to do um, to keep people in the cut, if you will? being able to play in season so um first of all there, there is a fundamental uh, misunderstanding with um the idea that it's easier for an actor or it's easier for the guy who can afford it it's hard for everybody and just because you're getting paid 
to do a job that requires the necessity of like looking a certain way doesn't make it any easier. Money never fixes our ability to quit a situation. Ever. Like it really doesn't. Um, and so for the people, first, I, like the people that think that, I would like to invite them to find out how good they can actually be if they themselves don't use that as an excuse. It's hard for everybody. We make it easier for sure. We try to minimize all the, the distractions that can derail the process by, you know, controlling food and teaching them how to eat and showing them that eating in a good way doesn't have to be broccoli and, and chicken every day. It, it can, you just have to have some kind of conscious thought. And that's why mindset becomes such a fundamental part of this is because it's, it's a conscientious decision to do something and, and to get the, the, the most longevity you'll have in any of this stuff is to make them understand why it's, what it feels like, why it's good for you and what else it can do for you besides get you a paycheck on a movie. So the idea is not just to like, yeah, there's a, we're all getting paid to hit this target on this date, but I'm looking past that target at what the other things are that will sell this person. Like I want to show them that being more capable is actually the goal. Being uh, psycho uh, psychologically more fit will make their job easier because mm. in their day to day, I mean, yeah, they're getting paid to, to be fit, but a lot of these guys are running micro empires. Like just a shooting schedule by itself is, and it's just absurd. Like, you know, most days, 12 to 16 hours, but then after that, they have like, they're constantly negotiating new deals, going to the next job, figuring out endorsement deals, figuring out their business, their investments, their other stuff. So they run out of time probably faster than most busy people. And so, uh, the money and the money doesn't matter. To, like they're not doing it for that most of the time. So it actually is a harder situation to fix. And that's why we try to put a mindset under the, underneath that whole thing. Like where the mentality behind this thing is a, you want it, you want it for good reasons. And, and it's going to, it's going to improve your life beyond just the six pack on the screen. Do you feel like that's actually helping them be more sustainable like a normal person could use in their just normal life? 100%. If, if what I did works, it doesn't always uh -huh. work. I'm not always the best salesman. Uh, sometimes I'm a very harsh trainer in that, you know, the, the, I, the, the undulations that your pendulum that you're describing, um, it happens. We see it every day when people pick up a, uh, you know, not to bash them, but like a 30 day challenge you're going to see a pendulum effect. That's an everyday kind of thing that we, and so I always try to stay away from the extremes, but we also see it because a movie is extreme. The, the intensity towards preparing for it is extreme. The training to them is very extreme. The, uh, the dietary stuff, um, all that stuff is just waiting to swing back and forth. We're not immune to that, but what we're really trying to do is minimize it and show people that on a, in a general basis, if you take care of yourself on the day to day, it'll be easier for the next one. Yeah. And that's what we've seen 100% is the, and we've seen both extremes to it. Um, guys on the first 300 that came back to play in the second, the, 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 the movie, scene, the 300. 300 yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. When they came back, there was some, all right, it's been seven years. Like, how did you treat yourself? Oh, shoot, yeah. Not everybody is a free, not everybody's a Spartan. And they knew they've gone through the process. They knew how hard it was. It was so hard on them that they saw this like, oh, I'm never doing that again. And it, it's like ingrained in them that it's so difficult. And so when they come back, we have to like talk them back into that process in a way that has more longevity than it did on the first one. If I might, I mean, we've worked with some of the same mm -hmm. casts sure. or people from um, similar casts. And one of the things that happened early in functional bodybuilding, which effectively is the road that you and the company that you used to work with kind of carved out. Um, in, in functional building at the beginning, there was a lot of, like, there wasn't as much movement awareness. So getting banged up and injuries were part of the thing. And that is in part what made it hard. It was a path to get people right. to okay. an end point. Mm -hmm. And it w the efficacy of it was was better than what we had seen before as far as time the level of intensity that you could create that had the the broad metabolic um application as far as like you know muscle mass increasing and fat loss yeah uh, simple profound and, and 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 useful when carving bodies for for film 
But by the second one, you're saying, yeah, as you saw the cast return. Yeah, there, there was um, – there's enough damage on these things. And, you know, I, I'm not one of those people that believes that CrossFit is harmful. Just like I don't think running is bad for you right. or deadlifting is bad for you. You just have to be a total asshole to, to blame something that's external on your internal problem. And that's generally right. what's happening. That being said, people are led into this by like really high intensity group training. They're led into doing things that they might not normally do because of peer pressure and all the like whatever the group mentality is. That needs to be very, very like that is a, a really strong poison that has a good effect through hormesis, but it lacks control if you don't have a, a masterful skill now when we apply intensity because we have to and we have very little time to teach people like these really complex movements i mean three months to get to a position the probably the last thing i'm going to choose is a snatch just because it's like <laughs> yeah. it's like a two-month buy-in to just be able to use a weight that's meaningful or or one that would do the thing so we lose all that time but we do to okay so but we take the rules from that movement and take away all the um, all the things that might cause harm. And then we try to apply that to something simpler with safety nets. So how it looks is, you know, if I want to implement a snag, well, I'm looking at like full body movement, quadrupedal movement. I'm looking at things that aren't going to fall apart under fatigue or load. So I start ending up looking like I'm using a machine, like a, a, a concept two machine, um, to, you know, mimic, uh, what, multiple snatches would look like. I've got almost triple extension. I've got all these mechanics that are very similar, not identical, obviously, and they lack a lot of the same physiological. And we're not going to make them as fit as we'd like to because there's no balance. There's no mm -hmm. real mm -hmm. coordination. Yeah. But we're getting the fitness kick for sure. Right. And we're getting the metabolic function. And I know I'm not, you're never going to hurt somebody on an aerodyne. Right. right, right. Go for it. Like, go all out. And I can tell somebody, go all out. But if I tell, you know, a group of 30 stuntmen who are all snatching at the same time, go all out. Fuck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> that, that's a subtle but really significant, uh, I think, distinction that you just made. Because, again, that comes back to functional bodybuilding. And functional bodybuilding, I think, loosely, as I, I would might define it on air with you or off air, would would be the absence of basic proprioception, balance, accuracy, some of those skill biased mm -hmm. things that just take neurological adaptation. So, Michael, you didn't start as a, a super trainer. You've evolved uh, into a super trainer, and your roots continue to uh, interest anybody that's ever read anything that you've done or anybody that knows anything about your background. As a starting point. <laughs> you were a hairdresser that said, I'm done with hair. I'm moving to bodies um, ish. And then you went from basic, basically hairdressing to Jim Jones. Mm. Is that, is that right? Correct. Yes. Yeah. Correct. What was the catalyst? Uh, it was, um, if I was going to, you know, narrate uh, what it was um, looking back on it, it would be different than what it was at the time. But looking at, you know, what caused that, it, it was just a, a love of, of being able to be part of a process of change. I, I was a hairdresser, but in the sense that I wanted to be the best hairdresser you could be. Like I learned from Vidal Sassoon. I went to like the, the best hair academies. I learned, you know, constructive, really skillful haircutting technique. When, when people talk about getting their hair cut, this isn't talking about like you know, I went down and got a trim. We're talking right. about it takes me two hours to cut triangular graduation and make it perfect. And that skill took me eight years to develop. So I developed this really, really, um, really precise skill. And what I noticed is that um, training and hairdressing are basically the same profession. People get their hair changed, not just because it's, you know, well, I want a haircut. Women specifically come in, they want to they want to change their hair because it can't change their life. And they need help in order to change something about them because they can't change the thing that's deeper seated. They hate their situation. They hate their job. Their husband sucks. Whatever the thing is. And it's my job to comfort that person and let them like, hey, let me take you on a, a journey. We're going to talk about it. We're going to give you a glass of wine. We're going to change your hair. You're going to look fantastic when you leave. And then you're going to feel like you made a change. It was totally superficial, though. The conversation was great. The people are great. The interactions were really genuine. But the results 
didn't equal anything that I could appreciate after six weeks and the hair grows out or she goes back to a life that's completely p mood of any like uh, any change, any real change. Another great uh, experience was uh, uh, on the first Man of Steel, I got to work with Antia Trout who played uh, the evil, I can't think of the character name now, but she was an amazing like East German girl, uh, amazing attitude, gymnastic background, but completely terrified of weights. Because her gymnastic background gave her the appearance that Hollywood likes to shame people for. So on one of the tricks, one of the tools that we use is self-imposed limitations. So one of the basic movements that's really good to show new uh, athletes or new people uh, an experience is using a deadlift. Because it's technically pretty easy yeah. to kind of at least be a novice at. So for her, it was a slow build to get her to pull heavy weight and heavy is relative to what she was capable. But we learned often that she was very good at counting. Like she would know exactly how much weight is on the bar. So I started just stacking a weight, putting a weight in, stacking away 15s and 10s and this until we work up to a weight that would have been maybe a new personal best for her. And she knows it. So she goes to pull, hovers for a bit, and then just quits, right? And then she like kicks the ground. She's like, oh, puts her hands on her hips and looks at me like, I know you're an actress, but I'm playing my role as somebody who's really concerned with her journey because that's my real role. Like I want her to develop. It, she doesn't need it to play Feora or whatever her, her character was. But I need her to get this to show that I can do my job correctly. So I go over, I take off some plates, I put smaller ones that equal the same amount. And then I'm like, all right, let's get you some confidence. Let's pull this thing, and then we'll readdress the one that failed. She goes, okay, goes to the bar, pop, pop. You know, hoop, goes right up. She looks at me, and I'm smiling, like bigger than you can ever see. And she's like, fuck you, you tricked me. She knows, because it's the same weight. Yeah. She weighs the yeah. same thing. She sets it down, and she has this moment of like, I can do something that I'm telling myself I can't. Like, that. that's a... That's a positive feedback loop that was taught on top of failure that will lead to another failure eventually, but you'll be able to go, okay, what was the thing? Like, okay, I didn't do this. All the lessons of the first thing will carry through. What I recognized in the moment was like, if I really want this to stick, I'm going to erase the whiteboard and we're going to sit down and have some coffee and talk about how that felt good. And that's going to be training. It really mirrored what I loved about hairdressing, develop a skill uh, cultivate that skill to the highest ability, test it, you know, do the, do this process and then rearrange the rules. So that skill makes you a phenomenal expert in wh whatever you're doing, whether that's punching people in the face or changing somebody's hair. So when people go to a hairdresser and they, uh, they tell the hairdresser what to do, that's a fucking fast food person. Like that's a clerk right. making a thing that's right. on a menu. That wasn't me. I was tailoring a thing that fit you know, and it sounds really dumb, but their bone structure, their head shape, their hair color, their texture, all this stuff went into. So when you sat down with me, I charge enough that you ask me what I can do for you. Like, how can you help me change? And so when somebody sits down, I look, I, you know, I get to know them a little bit, but there's a key moment where if I'm standing behind somebody, we're looking eye contact in the mirror and I can just touch their shoulder and reassure him that I'm going to do the thing that they want to get out of this experience. They have to let that, they have to trust me because somebody standing behind them that they don't know just made physical contact to them. That's a very vulnerable position. And so our psychology is either this person is a threat and I'm fucking out of here or, okay, this is a friend. It's an ally. He's going to take me somewhere where I, it's, I'm going to be in a better place. Now that, that's a really like deep uh, psychological human interaction thing on its own. But where I noticed that it really worked was that in being an expert, you have to always control the situation. You are not a menu item. People don't come to you and ask for a six pack. You tell them what they're capable of because huh. you can see beyond what they're capable of. That distinction to me is the difference between an mm. expert and just a novice. Um, in, in training people, the same exact thing. Usually we do an assessment. Like a wall squat is a really good predictive uh, movement for seeing thoracic mobility, ankle mobility, hip stabilization, all that stuff. Um, their, their inclination to move their neck during, you know, neutral spine, all this stuff like blah, 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 blah. 
and what's really great about it is it gives you two moments to teach a very valuable lesson. I start by first doing it and showing because I think that is a, like a, a really deep key towards coaching is to show somebody that you're capable. And so, and also to show them that it's easy, that it doesn't cost you anything. And I'll do the movement first because if I do it second, the, the situation changes. If you do something first and it's easy and they think they can uh. do it because the perception is easy, then they're like, wait a second, I want to learn this thing. And if you, if you make them do it and they fail and then you do it, oh, you they show think off. you're a freak. Yeah. And you think it's a, they, now it's a humility thing. Uh-huh. And they will deaden their response to that. So when I show them first, Clever. it's easy. Then they do it. I warn them about all the things that are going to happen. Two things will happen. If I predict correctly, if they have long femurs and their knee touches the wall, eventually they're going to move back to their heels. They're going to get really uncomfortable and then they're going to stumble and they're going to fall back. I said, good. You felt that tension. Now I'm going to stop you from falling. I want you to go down a little bit further. The second they go to fall, the same trust happens is when they're falling, their coach stop them from falling back by touching on their thoracic and pushing them forward. So it's it's a metaphor for what this situation is going to be during a transformation process. You're going to keep falling. I'm going to be there to catch you and make sure that it's okay. You're going to keep failing. I'm going to reassure you that that's part of the process. We all want to do this process. We just don't know how. We need guides. And Mark became really my first guide to mentally transforming myself. When I read Mark's words, it was like something clicked and I started to go down a rabbit hole and I started to read what he wrote about. Like, I, I just tried to pick up what he was doing. He was riding a bike. And I was like, I'm going to ride a bike. Like, I like riding bikes. So I would go ride a bike and try to experience what he was talking about. And I could because he described it perfectly. It had the words that matched what humans want to experience, which is self transformation. Very quickly, that turned into really having a disdain for the job that I was doing because I totally understood the superficiality of it. It was an ability to, now my conversations, like, I don't give a shit about your husband. I don't give a fuck about <laughs> like, Don't yeah. tell me about your stupid problems. I want to go ride my bike, get the hell out of my chair. Like, I know you're here. You want a cute cut. You think it's going to change your life. You haven't changed shit and I haven't changed anything, but you're stopping me from changing myself. And so I, I bought in really early. Some things worked out. Some really, really lucky things worked out to the fact where I got to meet Mark uh, I got invited to train and it changed my entire life. I spent all my money doing that experience without any kind of <laughs> cognitive idea of where it was going. And then when I was penniless, I was like, uh-oh, <laughs> like something now I got to like, now I've, I've literally like <laughs> ditched all my clients because I've been riding my bike and not working and doing random stuff. So I had to I had to pick up the pieces in order to like figure out what this thing was. I've never cared about money. I've never cared about that. I just don't want to be you know homeless. So I was like, I need to make a change. Something popped into my head on a Tuesday, and I told my boss I'm leaving on Thursday. And she asked what I was going to do. I said I'm moving home. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I think I need to do something different. Moved back to Salt Lake on a Thursday. Went down to my friend's gym. Asked if I could work. I had no idea what to do. So he said, yeah, bring in some clients. So I just like some people who had been interested. Hey, let me train you and we'll see where it goes. Uh, after about two months of that, I had I had developed a level of skill and at least knowledge. Now, the whole time while I'm, I'm educating myself, for the last five years, I've been reading and reading nonstop, like developing ideas, testing. I'm doing all this stuff. So it wasn't a, it wasn't a freebie. But in the two months of practical application of training people, it became really apparent that it was a little bit ahead of the curve from the gym that I was at. Uh, so much so that it became noticeable and I got invited to just work at Jim Jones. So I took that opportunity. Uh, I mopped the floors. I just became a student again. I developed the skill. I asked questions. Uh, and then another coincidence and luck made it so that I was the next person up for an assistant job on a movie and I just jumped on it and uh, prove myself there and my ability to like use what I learned and master the skill and all that kind of stuff. And it, it related. It, it, was a, it was a progression where I took, it wasn't just I'd been a, now I'm a trainer, I've been a trainer for a year and suddenly I'm working on movies. It was, I have been trying to change people for 10 years and I've been using the wrong tools and that I suddenly developed the right tools, but I had a decade of history on how to talk to them and interact with them and how to get them to be comfortable to in order to 
take my advice. So relatability was the transferable skill. Yeah. yeah. Want to take a break? Great time to take a break. Cool. Recently, while I was in London, I came across a colleague, Michael Price, who owns Perpetua. And I want to take a moment to thank our now sponsor, Perpetua Fitness. Well, thanks for the warm welcome. Uh, yeah. um, it's a privilege to be on the show and to be a main sponsor for the body of knowledge. Michael, how long have you been open in London? We opened in 2011. As Perpetua? No, we originally opened as CrossFit South London, but we wanted to offer more in terms of a hybrid facility um, and give it our own sort of flavor. And so we evolved and we felt like the brand needed to evolve at the same time. I've tried to create an experience that offers a huge amount of value. And value for me is a place where you come and you feel like you can grow, you know, mentally, physically, and spiritually. Michael, you've got two gyms, one in London, one in Dublin, and you've got some social media. Where are the gyms? Where can people find this awesome experience? And Where are you? Where do I find you? <laughs> yeah, it's a bit nosy, isn't it? Yeah. It's time to shut this thing down, lads. <laughs> I've got no more information for you. <laughs> you know what I mean? On the first Man of Steel, I got to work with Michael Shannon, who is by far and large, probably one of my favorite human beings I've ever met in my life. Funny that he plays a bad guy. Totally. <laughs> yeah. Totally. I don't know anything about celebrities, who's that? Uh, Michael Shannon, uh, he, he was uh, uh, Zod in, in Man of Steel. The bad guy. The bad guy. There you go. Yeah, yeah. His personality is so great for this stuff. And so the really interesting thing about him and why, why I loved working with him specifically um, wasn't because he was good at anything. In fact, that's probably the exact opposite bless his soul. I hope he doesn't get mad at me for saying this, but he is not a physical person. Like he had never played sports. So he came to us with the idea that he needed to make a transformation uh, because he's playing this big, bad general. And then about a couple, like maybe a month or two into pre-production, they were like, nah, 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 nah. We're going to do a CGI suit. So you don't need to train anymore. And he was like, oh, okay. Like whatever. He doesn't care. But what we had instilled up to that point was one, we showed him, hey, this is a big key that's missing from, from yourself. You don't know this about yourself. And watching him do a Turkish getup would make you pull your hair out. You were like, <laughs> watching him do like a, a push press and he's just like, like he's so, like just is, is awkward and offset and like you just couldn't coordinate one limb to the other. And so to get him to respond was to be like, well, let's show him, like he has an incredible amount of strength. He just doesn't know how to apply it. Yeah. Um, so we took all those barbell complex things out of it and we brought him to a leg press machine and showed him that he could press a thousand pounds. Oh, and right. then he was like, oh, I get it. And then the other the <laughs> mental aspect was just a, a really, like we have, I love Airdynes. Like, I know that sounds sadistic, but I, I've always loved them because an Airdyne or, a, you know, a machine that's counting and the effort is known, like a time trial, there's no escape from that. Like, when truth. You, yeah. When, yeah, when, yeah. When, you, when you decide to stop pedaling, the, it reflects your quit. Like, it, it yeah. reflects on the screen what is going on in your head. In which case, there's a really famous workout called 300FY. Mark oh, yeah. developed it. Yep. 300 fuck you for you don't know. The, the requirement is on the old 84 Schwinn Airdynes. You have 10 minutes to get 300 calories. If you didn't do it, fuck you. <laughs> because there was a lot okay. of talk about the 300 workout and people were doing it and like, oh, I did it faster. And then they would like, well, you didn't do the rep right. And it became right. this stupid contrived conversation. So this work kind of got thrown out of there. What we noticed from it is how absolutely terrible it is on people because they immediately, like the progression through this 10 minutes, you see all sides. Two minutes in and you're just like full throttle. I got this. Like your, your arrogance carries, it's louder than, you know, it's bigger than your stomach. At two minutes, you make a like, uh-oh, I, I bit off more than I can chew. So you tend to slow down. And then the halfway, you're like, okay, I'm halfway. And you do a little kick. At the seven-minute mark is the no man's land where you're just like, I'm never going to make it. Like all doubt, all the black hole, the abyss. And then you reach the last minute. And because you rode this roller coaster, you'll like sprint to impress me. And it's like, you'll never get 300 calories like that. You yeah. can't you have to consistently beat down that voice in your head. So I'm telling 
Michael Shannon this story about like what this does to you. And he's like, oh, uh-huh, yeah, okay. I come in the next day. He showed up early. We still continue to train him. Uh, and he's on the air dime, just thrashing back and forth, trying to get this thing to go. And then I'm like, I just sit back and watch him. I'm like, that's my man. Like, that's yeah. the kind of person right. I want to hang out with. Yeah. The person that didn't, he wanted a guy, he just needed a guy to like open the door and then he's going to fuck shit up from there on. So I wait till he finishes and he literally just like falls off the thing, falls on the floor. And I go over and look at the, the air dine and I'm like, okay. I'm like, you know, he stops hacking and coughing and eventually he's like, how the fuck do you get 300? And I'm like, <laughs> well, first of all, you don't have, you don't use the model from 1970 because that thing doesn't register calories. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. I was like, I forgot to tell you that we don't have the model of air <laughs> that we measure this on. Second of all, that's probably the single most impressive thing I've seen somebody do on a movie job and therefore he kind of... I just put Anchor my that. yeah yeah right. I t- I just anything he wanted to do I was game so we found ourselves I would take him to parks we'd la- we did this insane workout where you you know you lunge four hundred you, you lunge four hundred meters every five lunges you do five push press with two dumbbells you can't drop the dumbbells the entire time oh love it. man love it we went and it was Chicago in the summer and the humidity and there was a lightning storm going on and like the I, like in my head it's the most dramatic event ever there's torrential downpour. Uh, there's me, there's a tornado alarm going off in the background and I'm just looking at Michael Shannon like, why is that guy fucking here? Like, why right. is he doing it? He doesn't need to be in shape and he just wants to experience this stuff. And he was just like, this is what you do? And I'm like, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> this is, this is what but there's a purity of experience in that. I want to go back just so people mm-hmm. do know, and you and I have talked about this. Uh, for those of you that did just hear that workout, do know that uh, the Schwinn Airdyne records metrics differently than the air assault bike and mm, it's a subtle yeah, difference yeah. and people most Very people that difference. try to do 300 calories on an air assault Sorely bike disappointed. Uh, yeah you're yeah. not going to come anywhere near that we can get into that next time you come on or the mm. science of that yeah, yeah, yeah. and why yeah. different instruments measure different things mm. and how they do it but uh don't try that on an air assault bike i want to also go back actually mm-hmm. for a second you said uh, something you said way earlier that tied in very nicely to that story which you almost mentioned that when you bring intensity to the program, there is an additional responsibility. The mistakes that are commonly made are there's a bigger cost that you've got to pay attention to when you start adding the intensity, but that's the piece that actually causes adaptation. I mean, the whole premise of that is that you're allowing an adaptation. So the intensity is only allowed to work as long as you let the, the, the other side drop. So how do you make that balance where we get enough to cause adaptation, but we don't put ourselves in a dangerous, irresponsible positions? Um, I do this thing that's really rare these days where you show up and you coach somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime you can talk somebody into doing something they don't want to do, you're a coach. <laughs> okay. That's a wrap. See you next week. <laughs> <laughs> um, in all reality, I'm very, um, if I have a structure in my head of where we need to go and I know the stimuluses that need to be applied, I don't ever want to dictate on the day what the right stimulus is until I see the reaction. Because coaching is a reactive skill. You're not dictating everything. You're only 50% of the equation. The person's reaction to what you're getting, that's just as important. And if they show up tired, they show up, they had a bad night, they fight mm. with their spouse, they, you know, whatever happened, they're still here because they're responsible, but it's my job to do the right thing on the day. I teach two lessons uh, to people, the first of which is a very long road of uh, learning to not be lazy. You show up every day, put your shoes on, you do what what it takes. The next part is learning not to be an idiot. Not being lazy, like made me drop 50 pounds or made, you know, made me qualify for regionals. And then people have this ad hoc, post proctor hoc problem where they're like, if I do this, it does this. Therefore they just multiply the problem. But we've known for thousands of years um, that by, you know, different, uh, parables that that's completely untrue. Like the, the camel that gets to the house is not the best thing to get you in the house or in the military. Like the vest that saves you in the forest will kill you in the water. Right. So just because you went hard and it changed your life doesn't mean that going hard all the time and being lit, you have to, there's a adaptation there where you're like, man, I got to think about this thing differently. There's a, there's something that comes from like the, the pieces that you pick up aren't 
taught. Like no one teaches you that. And I think one of the, I had a lot of latitude as a trainer, even at Jim Jones for the most part, to construct situations that really tested that boundary. And yeah, for the, the most part, it was haphazard and it was like, learn, I learned my skill through a very brutal way of failing. Like I failed to get anybody anywhere for a really long time because I didn't notice, oh, like, ah, they're just weak. Ah, they're just mm. quitters. Ah, they don't mm. fit into my mental complex. I needed to pick up my own pieces, which weren't picked up at the time. To learn this stuff, I was in the middle of a really devastating like eating disorder that thankfully I pulled myself out of, but it could have easily never succeeded. Like I, I was told, hey, if you wanna if you wanna work here, you gotta like you gotta do the thing for real. And if you wanna do the thing for real, you gotta ride bikes or do the thing, because that was my thing. But oh fuck, I gotta get lighter. So I'm like a 195 pound human being trying to weigh 175 at six foot two, trying to race bikes, failing miserably, eating 1600 calories a day and riding my bike oh, for four hours. God. Just like just withering away. My fucking nails quit growing. My hair started falling out. Wow. And in the meantime, I'm like, you're fucking weak. Uh. You're this, you're that. I'm a, I am Jack's ironic sense of self. Is right. That, 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 and so it clicked and this, this isn't a, a play to say how important my wife is to me. But before we started dating, like my experience coaching her was probably the single most important thing that I ever saw coaching. And it came from me playing games like I do, like psychological warfare games. I got inspired to, to come up with a workout that would let people experience failure at some point. It's like a 10 tier mountain and each level that you go is a pass or fail. Now I was very specific about what that individual where their where their competency was on on finishing an event like it would go between an aerobic th- hard aerobic event to like a isometric hold or like on the, a plank or something so would, i would switch back between different modalities to test and i would put them right on the line where they had to push past where they think they could on every single event and then a rest period and then the next thing and then a rest period and next thing so there's 10 events um the second to last one was probably the hardest it was a 10 minute rack hold <laughs> oh, just standing. You can walk around. You can stand. You can do whatever. You just got to hold on to those things, and they can't leave your shoulders. Oh, wow! So at any point, if anybody fails, you're not even allowed to talk to anybody. You get your shit and you leave. And they're like, okay. And people know me that I'm like, okay, I'm a serious person, but I also like to joke, and that stuff's kind of funny to me. And so they're like, yeah, we'll play those games. I act like an asshole. I was an asshole, but it was in good camaraderie. Right. Um. So I explain the rules and I'm like, you just, you have to earn your right to see what happens. Like you can't just like quit and then like ha- be the guy who hangs Experience out. other people's glory. Exactly. You can't be a part of the ride unless you fucking don't quit. And so that was the idea behind it. So uh, the whole morning I'm throwing this at my clients and everybody's failing. Like nobody's making it through shit. They're failing all over the place. And Aaron was my client at the time. Now my wife, but at the time my client and we weren't dating. She thought I was gay. Because I was a hairdresser. (laughs) (laughs) And she gets to like this second event. And she's a tough girl. Like I know she's tough. And I give her really good. She blows past the first one. She's on the rings doing like a forward leaning rest thing. It's only a minute in. I think the time she had to make it was like two minutes and 30 seconds or something. Unbroken plank. And I look up at the clock. And then I look back at her. And she like was touching her knee. And then she's like adjusted her hand. And then went back. What are you doing? She's like. Oh, I just needed to adjust. I was like, get out of here. You quit. And she was like, no, are you serious? I'm like, yeah, there's the door. And her eyes just welled up with tears. Like immediately she was just like, well, I didn't know. And I was like, well, you didn't listen. And this happened for about two minutes. So I was like, seriously, the door's right there. You're interrupting the process. You got to get out. I didn't care about the, like, I never once was like, I need to get the money. I need to make more clients. I was like, I need to fuck with people and get them to see what I see about this stuff. And so I risked everything, my own income. And I felt it. I was like, oh, that was a bunch of money that I just lost. Like that was, that's going to hurt, but so be it. Like she wasn't tough enough. And so the next, like the next people fail, the next people fail, another girl fails. And like, I'm like, I just can't like, I didn't have it in. She's bawling in the bathroom and I couldn't, I like, I didn't at that point have the gumption to like, be like, you got to get out. (laughs) So so she comes out of the bathroom, the girl, the other girl who's bawling and she looks at me like ready to be coached. Like 
pick me up. And I was just like, I don't know how to do that part. Fuck. Like, uh. get out of here. Like, it literally was like a, something's wrong with this, like, system. So about an hour after that, like, that was the morning sessions. About an hour after that, I get a text from, from Aaron. And she's like, I got to come back and do it. You got to let me do it again. And I was like, no, that was the deal. I'm like, I still, like, I haven't learned any fucking thing yet. Yeah. And I'm just like, no, that was the deal, whatever. I'm going to just be like, you can not come in. You can, you know, you, I'll invite you to the next session if you still want. But that was that. She's like, no, seriously, I'm like having a fucking breakdown mentally. Like, I don't know what's wrong with me. I just need to come back and do that thing. I'm like, oh, yeah, this sounds like I'm like on a suicide watch situation. <laughs> so, like, I let her come back into the evening classes. But I'm like, it's going to be harder. Like, I'm going to give you harder things to hit because that's the only way that it makes sense. Uh, it's not fair to everybody else. And so she's like, okay. So she comes in, puts it back down, gets on the air down, starts warming up. I give her the things. She just starts fucking plowing through them. Like they're nothing. Like I'm the worst predictor of fitness on the planet. She gets through the 10 minutes of rack hold, drops a kettlebell. And so your, your, your score is dictated on how many snatches you can get before you drop the kettlebell. So whatever that is, if you don't get to that point, you score nothing. But the second, you know, you want mm. to. So she's swinging, and I'm just, like, watching in amazement. Like, she's not fucking quitting. She's on, like, rep 120, rep 130, rep 140. The fucking skin comes off her hands, and blood starts, like, literally on every single one. The whole thing is, like, dripping. I'm not going to fucking tell this girl anything. She's on a mission, and whatever I say, she's going to, like, throw that thing at me. She gets to like 217 and drops the fucking thing, looks at her hands and then grabs her bag and fucking leaves. And I like sat down and I was like, oh, I think I did something. <laughs> I, like, I think I created a scenario in which somebody was able to recognize a need to change. So, and that was a teaching moment for you. For me. I don't, yeah. She, she was capable of that. All it took was like a spark and then she was on her way. I didn't do anything there. Like, so that was that was the moment of we we call that kind of coaching leverage where there's a, a, a sort of shift in responsibility, mm -hmm. right? Where you where you just go from the power position of what it feels like to put people in the pain cave, which is very elementary and very primal and very basic, and it's just based on insecurities. Then there's a transition to excellent, masterful coaches where the, they understand this sort of um, delicacy mm -hmm. and stability of the. That, that positive psychology and that's what you needed that was the lesson for you yeah yeah and i wish i could say that that was it bing got it that was just the beginning beginning yeah it was like the I, I just started to recognize exactly how much i didn't know i knew enough to know how much i didn't know i think i feel like i understand what you're saying on a surface level mm -hmm. the basic idea of this bigger context can you give me any more concrete example of this or really spell this out the 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 transfer like the what happens from a to b like the what what are we really talking about here everything else was volatile so when we go into a workout and this is just one domain but it yeah. could be an allegory for life when we go into a domain and we quit or we don't perform as well as we think we should there's some kind of negative reaction to that and the idea is to let those negative reactions improve each sequential moment so that eventually you have less of those negative moments or what's actually going to happen is that you continue those negative moments but you've blossomed into something else you've you've become something looking back down that you didn't even think you could become because you were able to self-assess analyze and recruit and this doesn't happen on your own you need people to help you do this because we're all wired to lie to our, ourselves it's hard to describe what the process is because it's different for everybody. But some of the constituents are always the same. They include failure. They include quitting. What people don't want to talk about is positive reinforcement mm. because that's the direction you're heading. Mm. Like the negative stuff is just a way to like see which direction. And then as soon as I see a positive, I'm going to head in that direction until it's, it's just like a, a compass where and you're, you're waiting for the needle to stop. And then, okay, that's north. And then I start walking. And that, that uh, you need direction. You need positivity because that's your guide to show you where the positive stuff is. But you need the negative stuff to allow you to realize what is positive. So it's, it's strategic failure so that you understand then where to go next, right? So in, in like a, 
what I would say a physical example, because that's what yeah. we're generally talking about. Um, a lot of people use like effort. So if we're going to use our 10 minute effort on the air dine, okay. that the consequence isn't just that I didn't hit the number. That's what most people will superficially take away from it. Um, what really is, is like what the negotiation looked like. Like what was the reason why you slowed down in your head, your in head, your, negro- in your head. Yeah. Yeah. Let, let's like, let, let's analyze like, yeah, yeah, you didn't make the thing, but that's not the end of the the lesson. The lesson is like, it's seven minutes. What were the things that you told yourself that made it not worth continuing to go? And then let's talk about why those things appeared. So this is literally a conversation you're having with this person when they're done. 100%. Totally. And and that, that only happens once the trust is there and a relationship is developed. For a very long time, failing is just failing. And that's why I think a lot of people don't have a grasp on how to, what we call picking up the pieces is because we just identify failure as quitting or failure because they're not, they're too weak. Like I missed the lift cause I'm too weak. I'm like, no, no, no. It's deeper than that. Did you even think you would get it in the first place? Cause if you didn't, then we have a problem up here, not a problem in, in the muscles. One of the cool things about doing what you do is that effectively you're a Sherpa. That's a word that we will periodically use around here and that you take people up mountains. But in many ways, it's not so much about the objective getting to the top of the mountain. It's respectfully understanding the environment may or may not change. And that will also, by its context, change the situation. So there's a lot of responsibility in that process. And it sounds like that is something that you learned through now the decade plus that you've been coaching and training. Yeah. The, what, I, what I always – skills are transferable. If they're not transferable, huh. then they're party tricks. And I think that's the – like you could say that you, you climbed Everest or you, could, you used your, um, your climbing example, but um, the – the summit is not actually uh, the goal because if you stop at the summit, you're going to fucking die. I see even on a, like a physical transformation, they're like, oh, i got to get the six pack. Well, the worst fucking part about achieving that isn't, you know, maintaining it or staying around that area. It's actually realizing how unimportant that was. Yeah. And then the, you know, the reflection on the way, the dangers that you face, the thing, lessons that you learned along the way that led to that thing, that, that, that was the lesson building. And then the lesson from there should be not just to how to maintain it, but how to keep learning from that thing. And th- those are what I try to instill, you know, taking people up, but also making sure that they come down okay. You're using these people's physical practice to show them how to climb and to descend a mountain so that they can then pick whatever mountain they want, hmm. right? So in your example, learning how to be a hairdresser, learning how to physically train someone, whatever skill you want to do, if you understand that basic process of getting up something really difficult and getting back down, mm-hmm. you, you feel like you can do this in any area. Yeah. And I think like, a, and it, it's really hard to, because we're talking kind of esoterically about theory around mm-hmm. training, but how it hashes itself out is very interpersonal. Some of the best examples I've had are, are tricking, like having control. Uh, of a situation when you have control you're able to guide a little bit better but you never have total control so as a as for your example like a sherpa i have the right ladder to cross the thing or i have the right rope to show you like hey, this is how you do it you have you know whatever the equipment is with me the tools to accomplish the task are with me i just have to implement that in a way that gets you to realize how important that tool uh, is in the university education we can't cover any of what you just said <laughs> there's nothing like that <laughs> and I don't think <laughs> people really understand when they look at these celebrities or they look at celebrity trainers mm. like you right yeah. which is a term I'm sure that just drives you batty right it does. makes your skin crawl <laughs> and they think oh what is he doing what's his workout what's his diet if I do the workout and I do the diet I'll get that result Yeah. and I think your your demonstration here has been pretty clear that that is a portion of it mm-hmm. But that's only the entry level information. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. And this, I mean, talking to somebody who's very highly educated, obviously, and it's always like a, it's always kind of like a asterisk by my name when it's like, 
Michael Blevins, and nobody knows what to call me because I don't know what to call me. Like, I don't call myself a coach. I don't call myself a trainer. I, I generally jokingly, but with a, a little bit of honesty, call myself a self-assessment analyst. Like, I, I always pick up on whether people are able to view themselves like how they view them, like how they should view themselves. And that's how I title it. But the I don't have any certifications. I don't have any, like, formal education. Although I love education, like, I'm in love with the process of learning. I just took that and just tried to teach myself and learn from other people. So a question I get a lot from people is like, how do I, how do, what certs should I do? Like, how do you become a trainer? How do you do, uh -huh. like, how do you do, <laughs> this question comes up all the time. And first of all, I don't know, A, it's, it's luck, a lot of it. But if I was going to add constituents into what made up what I do, it's showing up and being valuable. So doing, doing something that somebody finds valuable and you'll, find people that can give you opportunity and then be ready to take that opportunity, like drop whatever. For me, I've always cleaned. Like when I would go learn from hairdressers, I would just start sweeping hair, handing them foils, cleaning up their mess, getting ready for their, like doing the laundry, doing the towels, folding towels. I didn't want to be the awkward person standing in the background. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Like I'm here to learn guys. I was just like, well, if I just learn, but I can do something that way, this person gets something out of me being there. Eventually I noticed they're like, Hey, you want to come in on Saturday? Like, can you help me here? Can you help me here? And then I could ask questions because I'm doing them a favor now. Now I'm valuable to that person. They're more likely to teach me. And so from hairdressing to Jim Jones, it was start at Jim Jones, get the mop out start cleaning the floors because the floors are dirty. And so I bought my way into some conversations by being valuable in a certain aspect. Somebody asked me, I taught a seminar recently, and somebody asked me about uh, mentorship and, and where to get educated. Same question. And I had a really hard time answering it. But the one thing I could give you is that whatever you want to spend on education, use whatever money you're going to spend on that. Find a city that has one to two people that you respect in your industry and go pay to be a part of their culture, whether yeah, that's at a right. gym, whatever, and hang out in an organic manner and see how that person interacts in real time. And the, what will happen is, you'll one, you'll either find out that that person is fake and it wasn't what you thought and they're not doing anything special. They just you know look cool on Instagram. Or you'll develop a relationship with that person with the opportunity to have a mentor. Like, I didn't know Kenny. Like, I've always admired I've listened to a lot of his stuff, known his story for a long time, and I've always said in the back of my head, man, I'd like to meet that guy. Like, yeah. I want to, I really want to, like, spend some time. We talk on a level that I think, like, I would really appreciate to hear some more things that he has to say. The last thing I ever thought was, like, Kenny's going to find me interesting. <laughs> I'm going like, to show Kenny. Well, he doesn't. This. So no, I know <laughs> he doesn't. The la that blah, wasn't in blah, my blah. head. And so the organic thing that happened was that we met through a mutual friend, and it it was just like uh, I think you, you were teaching a seminar in London, and I was yep. using that gym you're teaching out of, and uh -huh. Pricey was like. Oh, Kenny Kate's going, you know, Pricey is like yeah. swearing and kicking babies or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's, our, that's our sponsor. So, as, thank yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it's our did, you, did, you, did you say Kenny Kane? He's like, yeah. I, I literally just canceled everything that day, walked down to the gym, sat down totally late because I didn't know you're teaching. And I was just like, wanted to listen to him. Sure. Everything that came as my, God, I like, really like what he says. And then the opportunity we can work out. I'm like, cool. I want to work out with this guy. But I, I hope I didn't like bug you with questions or thing, anything. No, I, we just. Just chat. I mean, we, we couldn't stop talking. I mean, that was the thing. We couldn't stop talking. <laughs> the lesson there, though, that people don't really understand is you already you were already at a very high level of success when you did that. right? You weren't a nobody. This didn't happen when you were like an entry kid looking to get your way, right? For for training? Yeah. Um, or, I had I had, um, I had had worked with enough. Like I was educated enough and I had worked with enough clients to prove that I could take somebody through A to B. Yeah, right. So my point, though, is you had the humility to say you didn't need to go to this seminar to um, get the next celebrity client. Like there was no – this that added no chance of that actually happening for the most part. You had to have the, the humility to go, although I could stand over here and, and tell everyone I don't need this because I'm, I'm just going to go do my next thing. Actually, the opposite where I'm going to – humble myself and say there's somebody else that has value who maybe less people know of mm -hmm. but I am really interested in this and so I'm going to put myself in the situation where I go up and say man can I learn from you 
there's knowledge you have that I would like to have. And that's a really difficult thing for some people to do. But now look at the relationship that fostered. And now that will, of course, breed opportunity. So there's a really interesting thing when we talk about like human experience. A lot of people, I, I equate it. I wrote this article. I never published this article because it, it just didn't finish right. And it made me sound like a maybe an asshole. Like a, I relate like the experience of being a human to like boarding an airplane. When you board an airplane, you see people live through their class. It, it, it's total generalization. When you walk in, and I'm like an economy flyer, unless I'm on a project and then they give me a business class ticket. Other than that, I'm buying an economy ticket. So I'm not saying that it's yeah. a, that class thing. But the ethic that goes along with the class is very apparent. When you walk in first class, people are working very, very hard. They're on phone calls. They're doing their, they're typing. They're finishing up the last things that they can't do. They're just busy bodies, right? You then break that barrier you go to like comfort plus or whatever the fuck the new thing they're charging an insane amount for nothing different right but the prestige is that these people are learning and then you start to see like people have their like little tablets out and they're reading their books and their novels and some people are working some people are talking but they're starting to see a difference and then you go to coach and you see the epitome of human existence as what people think it should be which is i want to be comfortable like, I have my fucking neck pillow and my eye thing and my game and my other. Like, they're just like chips and like soda. Like, I just want, like, <laughs> uh, <laughs> just. <laughs> and you recognize that, that that isn't have anything to do with the price of ticket you bought. We're dealing with majorities. Now, there's something else that happens that a lot of people don't recognize that happens on private airplanes. On a private airplane, you have access to all the mm, movies, mm, all the free mm. shit, all the champagne. People aren't, they don't give a fuck about that. They're talking to each other. What shows me that if you had the most money possible to experience life, what you want to experience is human connection. You want to build a relationship. Once I really felt that, I was like, okay, I'm going to go through life just trying to build some relationships. Like trying to experience relationships. Add it, and that, that means I have to add to the relationship. It means I have to bring something to it. If I want to take something from somebody, I got to replace it with something else. That's how a relationship works. Michael, you um, you have some great writing available. Where can our listeners find your writings? Right now, I I write a few pieces um, for free on my blog. It's called uh, gritandteeth.com. I realize it just sounded like a thirteen year old girl saying my blog. Um, <laughs> Grit and teeth. Grit, Grit and, and teeth. teeth spelled out. And uh, it's where I'm on Instagram as well, uh, which I post some pictures and some stuff that goes along with some musings at the while. But I am uh, eventually working on a, a, a piece that's documenting this experience that I've had, and I can hopefully release that this year at some point. Um, so all that information will be found when it is available on my website and on Instagram. And I should just say winter is coming. <laughs> Good people. Thank you for tuning in, uh, hanging out with our guest, Michael Blevins of Grit and Teeth and uh, Superhero Training, uh, in addition to being a, a very high thinker who's helping advance this whole field of getting people fit, not just physically, but mentally. My name is Kenny Kane for Andy Galpin. Thank you very much for listening to The Body of Knowledge. Looks like you enjoyed the show. Make sure to go over to iTunes, go over to Shrug Collective, give us a five-star review, positive comment only, and make sure to go over to thrivemarket.com slash body to order your groceries this week.